20 AD. Four Roman legions surround Jerusalem. At the command of General Titus, they destroy the city and its temple. Over a million people perish. The fall of Jerusalem, a story of lost opportunities and forgotten warnings. It was the Ides of March, 44 BC, just 74 days into the new year. A date when most Romans settled their debts and engaged in several religious observances. But this particular year, events at the Ides of March shook Rome and marked a turning point in world history. Five years before, in January 49 BC, Julius Caesar, had openly defied the Roman Senate's authority by refusing to relinquish his military command. Instead, he crossed the Rubicon River and marched towards Rome at the head of a massive army. This bold and calculated move triggered a civil war, which ended with Julius Caesar seizing power and ruling as a military dictator of the Roman Republic. But Caesar's ambition and his popularist policies angered the Roman elite, which was mostly made up of influential and powerful Roman senators. In a bold and staggering move, these senators united to assassinate Caesar while he sat in his chair of office on the Senate floor. He was stabbed 23 times by men who pretended to be his friends. Julius Caesar's death marked a turning point in Roman history. But far from destroying his visions for a Roman Empire, his death provided the catalyst for its establishment. Caesar's dream for an empire were realised through the military genius and shrewd political manoeuvring of his adopted son Octavian, who was given the title Caesar Augustus, making him the first emperor of Rome and the emperor at the time of Jesus' birth. In a far-flung corner of the ever-widening empire, a poor carpenter and his wife traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The wife was heavily pregnant with her first child and she ended up giving birth to a son in a rough-hewn stable behind a crowded inn. That baby boy, wrapped in swaddling clothes and nestled in a humble manger, was far removed from the opulence and power of the Roman imperial court. And yet, he wielded more power than any Roman emperor ever would. This week, we launch a new series, taking a look at the story of two kingdoms and two ideologies. The rise of Rome changed the entire world but so did the rise of Christianity. One world, two kingdoms. Two kingdoms with vastly different methods and messages. Join me as we explore the birth of both the Roman Empire and the Christian Church and how each kingdom impacted and opposed the other in this week's episode of The Incredible Journey. The Roman Empire was born in 27 BC, after nearly two decades of bloodshed and turmoil. It all began when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in defiance of the Roman Senate. But it didn't end there. Caesar's plans for absolute domination over Rome never saw the light of day. His sweeping reforms and ambitious plans rankled the political and social elite of the Republic and created powerful enemies among the ruling elite. The situation came to a head in early 44 BC 
and began to tip dangerously close to treason in the aftermath of a string of events, each more incriminating than the last. Each of these events seemed to point to a single inevitable result in the minds of the Roman Senate. It seemed to them that Julius Caesar not only wanted to change the social and political status quo of the Republic, but that he actually wanted to do away with the concept of a Republic altogether and crown himself King of Rome. So on the 22nd of February, 44 BC, Cassius Longinus met with his brother-in-law, Marcus Brutus. Both men were Roman senators and both men feared that Julius Caesar was amassing too much power. In the dead of night, under cover of darkness, the two men hatched a daring and sinister plot. Julius Caesar must go. He needed to die and they were more than happy to make it happen and facilitate his demise. Quickly and quietly, they began to undermine Julius Caesar and recruit other senators. Now, while it only takes one man to assassinate another, no matter how celebrated a general he is, Brutus and Cassius felt they needed insurance. In the event that Julius Caesar's supporters grew violent and accused them of treason, they needed to have a plausible argument in favour of what they had done. They figured that if they could gather the support of enough leading Roman senators, they could legitimise the assassination and so save their own lives. One senator after another joined the plot. Soon the network of co-conspirators included the most influential men in the Senate. It seemed that everyone was in on the plan. Everyone except men like Mark Anthony Julius Caesar's most trusted right-hand man. A Senate meeting was scheduled for the Ides of March, the 15th of the month, and it was decided that the assassination would take place that day on the Senate floor. When Caesar arrived and walked onto the Senate floor, the conspirators sprang into action. Lucius Simba was the first player to act. He approached Caesar's seat with a petition. Simba petitioned Caesar to allow his exiled brother to return home to Rome. While Caesar was reviewing the document, the conspirators slowly advanced on him. Under the guise of a show of support for Simba and his exiled brother, they surrounded Caesar and some of them, giving vent to their rage, began to manhandle him. Then Casca struck the first blow which Caesar managed to deflect. Surprised and enraged, Caesar began to demand that the senators move back. But instead of retreating, they pulled out their concealed daggers and stabbed him 23 times. It was a terrible, grotesque end to a powerful man's life. Caesar's death triggered a wave of bloodshed and turmoil throughout the Republic. On the 16th of January, 27 BC, Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, was given the title of Augustus by the Senate. And just like that, a republic was transformed into an empire. But it wasn't a transition that occurred in the blink of an eye. After Caesar's death, Octavian began quietly accumulating more and more power until all the carefully separated political powers of Rome centered around him. He embodied the roles of senator, consul, tribune, pontifex maximus or high priest, and supreme military commander all at once. While some viewed him as a brilliant visionary, others wondered if he was nothing more than a bloodthirsty, power-hungry tyrant. There were times that he was both, but Octavian proved to be a competent emperor, the first in a long line of Roman monarchs, each crazier and more bloodthirsty than the last. Under Octavian, or Augustus Caesar, as he came to be known, Rome moved from being a republic to an empire. 
He transformed the city of Rome with an aggressive and opulent building program. He commissioned new theatres, aqueducts and roads using the finest materials that could be procured from the farthest parts of his ever-widening empire. But he didn't just rebuild the Roman Empire. He restructured its political landscape as well. He centralised all the religious and political power of the empire in his own hands by establishing an imperial cult, making himself a god and encouraging citizens throughout the empire to worship him. He became supreme ruler, commander of the imperial forces and supreme high priest of all the temples. It was a radical and bold change, one that most Romans submitted to because of the prosperity and relative peace the empire enjoyed under Caesar Augustus' watchful and calculating eye. The great Pax Romana, or Roman peace, where the empire was free of both internal and external conflict, was one of the greatest achievements of Caesar Augustus' reign and marked the birth of the Roman Empire. But behind this progress and prosperity lay one of the most powerful and ruthless armed forces history has ever seen. All Roman political leaders were expected to have served in the Roman military and Caesar Augustus was no exception. He had proved himself on the battlefield during the civil wars immediately following Julius Caesar's death. And under him, the Roman military machine grew and expanded, boasting nearly a quarter of a million trained, disciplined troops when Caesar Augustus died in 14 AD at the age of 75. When Caesar Augustus died, the early Roman Empire had spread to encompass the entirety of Italy and the Iberian Peninsula, including Gaul and Transalpine Europe, reaching as far as the Danube, much of the Balkans and Asia Minor. It also included a significant chunk of the Levant coast from Antioch in the north to Gaza in the south. The Roman Empire was the only superpower in history to rule every shore of the Mediterranean basin, reaching further inland than any other ruling power. At its peak, under the Emperor Trajan, Rome covered about five million square kilometres, stretching from Hadrian's Wall in Britain right down to North Africa, and from the Atlantic in the west to the banks of the Tigris River in the east ruling over about a quarter of the world's population. One of the defining qualities of Roman rule was conquest and assimilation. Conquered territories were Romanized with an infusion of Roman art, culture, religion and philosophy. The Roman Empire was an iron-fisted machine, centrally commanded by powerful despotic Caesars and fiercely guarded along its wild borders by the most powerful military force on the planet, Rome was probably the greatest empire the world has ever seen. It was Roman military might that made the empire so strong and enduring. Rome cultivated a warrior culture, as is seen in the fact that securing political office, even within the old Republic, was dependent on having served in the military. This meant that Rome's most significant achievements were gained on the battlefield and the entire state machinery relied on a professional army to survive and thrive. At its peak in the 3rd century AD, Rome boasted nearly half a million field troops across the empire. These comprised legions, which were heavy infantry units, 5,000 men strong. The Roman army was spread throughout the empire and consumed a large percentage of the imperial treasury. Not only was the Roman army ruthless, but they were incredibly disciplined, bordering on nearly superhuman. They were also fast, marching great distances in short periods of time, through all kinds of terrain and in all kinds of weather. Virgil, an early Roman philosopher and writer, commenting on the purpose of the Roman army, once wrote, 
Your task, Roman, will be to govern the peoples of the world in your empire. These will be your arts, to impose a settled pattern upon peace, to pardon the defeated, and to battle down the proud. The Roman army, especially during the Republican era, had waged wars that have gone down as some of the most brilliant and unrivaled battles in history. They defeated the Macedonians and Seleucids, and most famously, the Carthaginians. The Carthaginian general, Hannibal, even added elephants to the mix, riding one into battle over the Alps in 218 BC in an attempt to crush the Roman Republic. But his best efforts failed, resulting in the complete annihilation of his capital, Carthage, as retribution. But as iron-fisted and iron-hearted as Rome was, it created a unique period in history. The Pax Romana, or Roman peace, created an environment of peace and security when the empire, covering much of the then known world, was free of both internal strife and external conflict. Roman roads united this world and made travel and trade easy. There was a common lingua franca, a common language, Greek, that was spoken across much of the empire and made communication easy within the empire. This unique environment, this unique time in history created by the Roman Empire, proved to be the cradle that nursed another world-changing movement, one that didn't use the military machine to accomplish its ends, but conquered the entire world nevertheless. In a far-flung corner of the empire, in a little town nestled in the hills of Galilee, a carpenter named Joseph sweated over a difficult decision. He was engaged to a young woman named Mary who had come to him with a far-fetched and disturbing story. Mary claimed to have been visited by an angel who told her that she would give birth to the long-awaited Messiah. Now, Joseph was a pious man. And like any other Jew during that time, he had high hopes regarding the appearance of the Messiah. Jews in the first century AD believed that the Messiah would come and overthrow the Romans and set up an eternal and invincible kingdom on earth with Jerusalem as its centre. But Mary's story was just too unbelievable. Back in the carpenter's shop in Galilee, Joseph was trying to figure out a way to quietly end his engagement with Mary. She was pregnant and he was not the father. But Mary claimed that the child was the son of God. That night when Joseph went to bed, he had a dream. In it, an angel appeared to him with a special message saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Once the angel had confirmed that the child Mary was carrying was indeed the Messiah, he outlined the Messiah's mission to Joseph. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The Messiah's mission was not to save his people from the Romans, but to save his people from their sins. However, the popular misconception of the Messiah's work followed Jesus throughout his ministry on earth. Every miracle he performed, every sermon he preached was misconstrued and viewed from the paradigm of a Jewish revolution against the Romans. It was the most fervent hope of the Jews and one they hoped that Jesus would fulfill and bring to fruition. Though Jesus repeatedly tried to change their paradigm, his words fell on deaf ears. When the people realised he could feed 5,000 men with nothing more than a few loaves and fishes, they were delirious with excitement. They imagined him feeding an army of thousands with meagre resources. When they saw him healing the sick, they imagined him healing wounded soldiers on a battlefield. When he raised the dead, they realised that 
they could be invincible. But Jesus had other plans and another mission. He had come to save the world from sin, not save the Jewish nation from the oppressive heel of Rome. He moved steadily towards his mission undaunted, even when he was betrayed by one of his most trusted disciples and denied by another or arraigned before Pilate. Jesus consistently and clearly articulated the purpose of his life and work. When Pilate, the Roman proconsul in charge of judging and sentencing Jesus under Roman law, asked Jesus if he was the King of the Jews, Jesus said to him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. Pilate responded by asking Jesus the same question again. So are you a king? To which Jesus responded, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus' mission was entirely spiritual in nature, whereas the Jews were looking for a Messiah who would lead a military revolution. In their anger, hatred and bitter disappointment at his unwillingness to align himself with their ideas, they called for his death. Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross, a punishment reserved for common criminals. It was the most painful and excruciating death ever devised by man. However, though it seemed that Jesus' entire mission had ended in defeat, The iron fist of Rome could not crush him. Three days after he was laid in the tomb, Jesus rose from the grave triumphant and victorious. His mission accomplished. Because of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, every single person, every one of us, has hope for a brighter future an eternal future. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus' mission on earth was to offer every human being the opportunity to experience freedom from the shackles of sin, a freedom that brings inner peace, hope and happiness. To this end, he lived and served and died. The city of Jerusalem was at the heart of Jesus' final moments on earth. He was crucified right outside the walls of the city. And just before his crucifixion, he had wept over its inhabitants' blindness and unwillingness to accept the gift of life he offered. From Jerusalem, The Christian church spread like wildfire throughout the Roman world. The movement was often regarded with suspicion by Roman citizens and power brokers alike. In a world where people worshipped a pantheon of pagan deities, the idea of worshipping a single god was considered to be ridiculous. Worse yet, the idea of worshipping a god who became a man and allowed himself to be crucified on a Roman cross beggared belief. The term Christian was first coined in the Syrian city of Antioch, where the followers of this new movement were named Christianos or Christ followers. But it wasn't just radical ideas that set Christians apart. It was a radical lifestyle as well. Greco-Roman civilization centered around temple worship. The gods were an integral part of daily activity. Christians, however, refused to acknowledge any God but the one true God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Christians refused to conform to social norms and trends that were steeped in pagan religion. Christians were so radical and countercultural that when Paul went to the city of Thessalonica in Greece, the locals exclaimed, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And it was true. The new Jesus movement turned every social expectation on its head. 
Christians were hated by both Romans and Jews alike. And yet the movement blazed a trail through one of the most secular and hedonistic empires the world has ever seen. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the Jews were still waiting for a Messiah. Tempers were rising, expectations were growing. The Jewish nation was chafing against the bonds of their Roman oppressors. Before long, the simmering resentment would boil over in a seething rebellion that would bring both Jerusalem and the Jewish people to their knees. Join us again next week as we take a look at the Jewish revolt, the Roman response and the fall of Jerusalem. If you would like to know more about the rise of Christianity and its central message, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the booklet, A Clash of Empires. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive your free gift today. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 770 800 0266 in the United States or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at the addresses on your screen or email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed our journey back to the days of the ancient Roman Empire and the time when the Christian church began, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray to the great God of the Bible. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You that we worship a God who loves us and who cares for us. We thank You for the opportunity You give us to experience freedom from the shackles of sin and guilt, a freedom that brings inner peace, hope and happiness. We thank You for Jesus who makes that possible. In His name we pray, Amen.